think the question that we're going to tangle with today, has that been split into a kind of different gender formations where we no longer have the type of solidarity we used to in the 1960s in terms of identifying an opponent and being willing to move against it? Well, I, I, I want to ask this about what you mentioned about you know, the the Black introduction into government roles. Um, and this is even shown in pop culture of the time. I can't remember the name of the movie with Diane Carroll and James Earl Jones. Talking about the, oh, um, oh, that's a very important movie, Claudine. Claudine, Claudine. where you know it actually gets into not that deep into the weeds of like you know you can't have a man in in your home, and there were people that worked to get the men out of the homes, right? Um, and that's part of that story where they're hiding James Earl Jones's like underwear or something like that like in one of the scenes. Very Moynihan. Very, very, very Moynihan-esque. But let's remember that these programs are born out of not wanting even women to work when they're rolled out uh, in the 30s. Um, that's what a lot of that that was for. I can't remember the original name of, uh, of welfare, but it was designed for non-working females. And this is, you know, a, a, an era well, where... Go ahead. Yeah, it was designed for white women, right? Yes. Particularly white women who were widows. Mm -hmm. Right. right. So, you so the whole yeah. notion of, of the family is a white project and a white supremacist nation. I mean, if the nation, like, you know, was born out of genocide, right, and enslavement, then part of what it disposes um, or tries to kill is the very notion of family cohesion and community cohesion in indigenous and black communities or nations, right? Mm -hmm. So this is this is where it becomes really complicated for me when I try to see what the fulcrum is like on the seesaw, how do you balance this? The nation really works for white women, but to some extent it had to include black women within the category of human to some extent, right? Well, what do you say if when people you, say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off. Uh, it, well, if you were performing the duties of the state, mm -hmm. like you can entertain them. But as Eartha Kitt found out, you know, in the Johnson administration, mm -hmm. once she came out against the war in Vietnam and confronted Lady Bird, you know, the first lady, Johnson's wife. I mean, according to some scholars, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who supported civil rights, gave the pin, you know, to King signing Voting Rights, Civil Rights Act, et cetera. Uh, he used the CIA to destroy Eartha Kitt's career. Destroyed her so, career. Like, you're, you're told if you can entertain and sing for us or dance for us or we like that movie or, you know, historically, you know, you nurse our kids literally on your breast, right? If you can reproduce our family integrity, you are tolerable. If you seek agency autonomy for civil rights and human rights, you're a pain in the neck and maybe you should disappear in whatever way, lose your job, lose your housing, lose your freedom, go to prison, or, you know, like Malcolm and Martin, lose your lives, right? Yeah. So. I, I just, I just wanted to add, add to that, you know, um, mm -hmm. as, as the, those original aid packages were being rolled out, as the new deal was getting rolled out, I think 1935, um, Divorced women could not get it. Um, uh, uh, non non widowed women with children couldn't get it. So there definitely was uh, caveats on who who could get aid and who who could not get aid. But what I wanted to add with with your very very astute point about adding black people into the government apparatus is when these people were part of the system, so to speak there was kind of a unified voting block with the people that were a part of the system receiving the aid and now the people that have moved up into a new middle class and we definitely see this in the early 70s that are part of the same system so they're kind of voting in unison to keep these programs and you definitely see this in the more major metropolitan northern cities when you look at a place like atlanta when they have their first black mayor in Maynard Jackson, one thing he does is increase the business sector. And you turn Atlanta 
you know, Coca-Cola, the massive airport, which becomes a hub, private capital is now hoisting these same black people into the middle class. And they're not so aligned with their poor and working class black neighbors. Um, I believe towards the end of the Jackson administration, we actually see the destruction of a lot of the uh, housing, the, uh, what, do you, what would we call it? Government housing um, in Atlanta as well. So th there's, there's an interesting you know, juxtaposition when we talk about like, you know, including black people into the government apparatus, you know, trying to <laughs> protect the system, if you will. And then also when you have private capital, and there's there's right. the, the demarcating line almost of class. Isn't it, isn't it, this has become a practical or pragmatic aspect, right? Mm -hmm. That once you're included into an apparatus or a structure, then the logic would be that you would protect it. And so once you have black people protecting state accumulations, corporate accumulations, those who are left behind or are just seen as even more deficient. I mean, this is part of the reason I avoid the language that we've inherited today about, it's not just black girl magic, but black excellence, right? Mm -hmm. As if that everybody else is mediocre or substandard, which, which is so aligned with the language of white supremacy. Like, how do you know you're excellent? Is because you got the corporate job or you got the degree or, you know, the JD, PhD, whatever, how many Ds, you know, doctorates or whatever is happening here. But the larger picture is this is a capitalist society that was built on slavery, rape, and genocide, and that the accumulations always accrue to the top. So if you're ethical, you would want to tinker with that machinery. And not just be seduced by all the, you know, what's the glittery, you know, well, the glittery could be a Tesla. Back in the day, might have been a Cadillac or something. I don't know. But I think one of the questions we have to think about is what is our collective position on something that looks like a mixed economy or socialist economy? And so how do we stop these buyouts that turn those who remain in certain zip codes as disposable or vulnerable to poisoned water, think of Flint, Michigan, poisoned air, you know, disproportionate exposure to police violence and civilian violence. Well, it's, you know, it's really, what I really appreciate in, is in your discourse is that it's very much in alignment with the narrative that we try to expose on our show is that like any other people, Black people have class internal stratifications and conflicts like everyone else. And unfortunately, because of the way in which society portrays Black life as a unified underclass phenomenon, mm -hmm. the stratification of class, which has been a reality of Black life going back to the days of free people of color societies, is completely obscured to the majority of not only uh, Americans overall, but also to many black black folk in america as well who are not necessarily connected to those within these communities who are more proximate to capitalist power or the gatekeepers or the ventri racial ventriloquists if you will so the narrative that you are very eloquently exposing is very much in line with what we try to do in terms of trying to complicate the notion of collective community we in, in other words and you may disagree with this, and I will respect you if you do, is that it's very important for us to complicate the notion that Black people work as a unified community, because our argument is that that renders Black people to a politics of containment. In other words, Black politics is contained and used as a pawn of the ruling class, because the ruling class will choose the racial ventriloquist who speaks for the masses, undemocratically chosen, while the masses have no say in the agenda and they're moved like a piece on a chessboard. So black politics becomes a politics of containment in the rendering of collective community in that fashion. And it's, it's, it's something that 
we on our show try to challenge effectively. I, I like to make the argument that there are multiple black communities, not just mm-hmm. one black community, if you will. I yeah, like that, to hear that. Them. Yeah, that's great. And, and and it's making me thinking there are multiple black feminisms in the plural, mm-hmm. not just one form of black feminism. And that should also be stated for abolitionism plural, not just one form of abolitionism, right? But it, yeah, I totally agree with your analysis. And then when you're speaking, I'm starting to think about how we were warned about this, right? When Malcolm was talking about the big house in the field, right? So the big house today could be, you know, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, you know, um, working for the State Department in its foreign um, projects are working for the DOJ, you know? So there was a moment in the 1990s, I think it's 1993 or 94, when Kathleen Cleaver was the first woman to sit on the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party. And this is Oakland before, you know, things went one way and, you know, Cleaver left and, and the party fractionated in part because of the violence of the COINTELPRO, but also the contradictions and the violence, which based on my assessment, largely started coming or originated from Oakland, right? But Cleaver says in this interview, and it's for me, it's very curious because I believe she's being interviewed by Henry Louis Gates, who's obviously in the big house called mm-hmm. Harvard. Um, so Cleaver is saying that the Panthers had to pretend they were a unified front in terms of as black people because that had to be projected out. So they thought as a political strategy, but they clearly knew that the black middle-class, the petty bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie um, blacks with means and money and ambition, that they were going to be hostile to the Black Panther Party as a revolutionary or proto-revolutionary formation. But it wasn't even an internal conflict, right? But also they would be hostile to you know, supporting liberation movements in the so-called third world or global South. Mm-hmm. So there's always been a sector of the black communities, as you've said, in plural, that have been trained or prone or see it as an opportunistic, you know, in fo- port- portfolio, whatever, um, to work for the state and to work for the corporation. And it, doesn't seem to have been really an impacted people that working in these um, zones would be an extension of anti-black violence, but this time with black faces. Thank you for watching. Please don't forget to hit like and subscribe on your way out. You can catch the live stream of This Is Revolution every Tuesday through Thursday at 6 p.m. Pacific time and Saturday, 9 a.m. Pacific time. This is Revolution.